So let me encourage everybody to find your seats so we can get going. So welcome everybody to the annual soy luncheon at the World Food Prize Borlaug Dialogue Symposium. This is now I think the 11th year that we have had the soy luncheon. One of the uh, highlights uh, of the year for me is calling up the laureate and telling her or him that they've uh, won the World Food Prize. But in a close second place is the uh, day that Mashal Hussein, our vice president, and I come over with Linda Funk. I don't know, Linda, are you here? There she is. And we go back with the chef in the kitchen and we try out all the soy dishes. Uh, all the soy recipes, and uh, they've been amazing uh, there. Uh, but I have to, I have to uh, reveal something that Michal and I scheme. Uh, I know you don't think that of, of Michal, but uh, of me. Uh, and and we say, oh, this one we're not sure, so we can get another dish to try uh, on that. But um, we are so very, very grateful to the United Soybean Board the Iowa Soybean Association, Soy Foods Council, and the World Initiative for Soy and Human Health for their sponsorship uh, in this. So I always want to begin by saying thank you. Thank you for making this possible. Uh, John Motter from chairman of the uh, USB, United Soybean Board. Uh, and that Bill Shipley, where Bill, where, there you are over there from Iowa Soybean Association. And uh, a constant in all of this, John Beckerer, and that John th there. So, um, but you know, I told John there's a rumor going around about him that he's retiring, and I'm sure that's not true. And that, but John, thank you. You've been a wonderful partner in, in all of this. Um, we are so honored uh, today uh, to have President John Dramani Mahama, the former president of Ghana with us as a special guest of honor. Mr. President, could you stand up so we could recognize you? <laughs> right next to our laureate, Dr. Akinwumi Adeshina. Dr. Adeshina, please stand up so we can recognize you. <laughs> and they're next to our chairman, John Ruan III. John, Janice Ruan's here. Thank you for this. Would there. Um, we um, start uh, this uh, event by, oh, I almost forgot. M uh, Barbara Grassley is here, the wife of Senator Chuck Grassley. And that, you know, S Senator Grassley is a legend in the United States Senate for never missing a vote. Never misses a vote. And that, so he's not here today, because there's probably a vote in Washington. Yeah. Wait, he, he's, e he's, either, he's either voting or out running, <laughs> or, or driving to all 99 counties in Iowa. And that, so the, the senator never forgot where he came from. But uh, Mrs. Grassley, uh, could you stand up? Uh, it's her birthday on Saturday, so could, could you all join me in wishing her a very, very happy birthday. The, um, <laughs> we, uh, we have a special moment at the beginning of, uh, of this event where we recall a wonderful friend, David Lambert. 
Uh, David was an incredible hunger fighter, dedicated man, served at the uh, U.S. mission to the U.N. agencies in Rome, close collaborator with George McGovern, and a dear friend of mine. And two years ago, here on UN World Food Day, after coming to being at the Laureate Award Ceremony at the Capitol, came back to the Marriott, was downstairs talking with everybody, and passed away that night. And uh, in his memory, his very, very good friend, Dr. Manjit Misra at Iowa State, has established a special scholarship. So pleased that David's son, Walker Lambert, Walker over there, could you stand up so we can welcome you, is here. And, and Manjit Misra established a special David Lambert Hunger Fighter Scholarship for a student at Iowa State. So Manjit, could you come up here with our winner? Next year, I have to seat you closer to the stage. That makes sense. Anyway, come over here, Emily. Emily Yugen from Monroe, Iowa, sophomore at Iowa State, in the Global Resource Systems major. You know, I hope you're taking some classes over at the Seed <laughs> Science Center, uh, number one seed science center in America, right? That's what you told me to say, wasn't it? <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> uh, and there, and. Um, we, and she's also been uh, in Uganda, out in Kamuli District, in there. But I want to tell you, come here, I want you to know about, uh, about her and where she got started. So she came, when was it, to the Global Youth Institute in what year? 2014. 2014. And was out in this audience, right? Yes. And, and began her journey and inspiration by Dr. Borlaug here, and here today are 200 other high school students. She was in high school when she came here. 200 high school students from 27 from Iowa, 27 states, nine foreign countries. All of you out there, stand up so we can see you. We have, uh, and uh, Dr. Adeshina, when he's been here, has uh, been, uh, had his picture taken uh, with, the, with these students. They uh, then, uh, some of them, will get to go on and become Borlaug Ruan interns. Some go on to become Wallace Carver Fellows with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, a uh, program started by Secretary Vilsack, and uh, the Agricultural Research Service, ARS, at USDA uh, is our prime partner in, in all of this. And we're so grateful Dr. Simon Liu is here. And I want to thank him and ask him to convey our thanks to Dr. Chavanda Jacobs-Young for all that partnership we have, because we'll have 30 to 40 of our former Global Youth Institute members. They are out doing assignments at USDA. So you were at the National Agricultural Environment uh, Laboratory, which is what, in Washington? In Ames, Iowa. In Ames, Iowa. Washington, Ames, you know. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, and had that uh, terrific uh, experience. But those students wouldn't be here except for their teachers. And there's about 200 teachers out here. Would you stand up so we can thank you? Thank you for inspiring. <laughs> Thank you for inspiring that next generation. And, that. and uh, also, out there are about 40 or 50 uh, former students in GYI who are Borlaug Ruan interns, 
Wallace Carver Fellows, George Washington Carver uh, interns, all part of our youth program, who have come back, taken time off to come back and help guide all these students. So you Borlaug Ruin interns, Wallace Carver Fellows, George Washington Carver, stand up there so we can recognize you as well. Uh, that. Now, all those programs, you think uh, the World Food Prize must be a really big organization. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the reality is that uh, the individuals who do that, uh, Keegan Kautsky, Libby Crimming, Kelsey Turrell down there, and the, as always, missing Crystal Harris. Uh, <laughs> where uh, that. But stand up so we can uh, acknowledge you. So here, here, here's the point. Here's, here's the point. If Crystal were here, and I'm always saying that, and that, and there were five of us, that would be 50% of the entire World Food Prize staff were here. So everybody does a lot of work. And Michal Hussein is here. Michal, stand up. As that. So now there is 50% of us uh, here, and that. So. You know. So you know, here, here's the thing, uh, and that for young people like that, they come in my office, and they say, you know, we've impacted 10,000 students. That's pretty good, huh? but that's uh, 300 Borlaug Ruan interns, 200 Wallace Carver fellows, several thousand Global Youth Institute. But you know, they're like youth; they're never satisfied. They want to do more. They said, we can do a million. We want to do 5 million. We can inspire 10 million, and not just in America, around the world. So I have somebody who's here who's going to come up and talk to us about just that kind of expansion that she has in mind, a member of our Council of Advisors, the president of Wageningen University, which she mentions to all the Iowa Staters and Purdue and Cornell that they're ranked number one. And uh, uh, I'm not I don't get into political uh, fights <laughs> and disputes uh, and that. But Louise, please come up and share your vision. If you ruled the world, what would you change? Now you can solve the greatest challenge of our century and win an amazing trip to the USA. There's so much happening on our small planet. The number of inhabitants is growing at breakneck speed. By 2050, we'll have a global population of some 9 billion people. That's one and a half billion more people than today. How can we prevent starvation? How can we ensure that all these people lead long and healthy lives? And how can we produce and transport enough food to feed everyone in a sustainable yet profitable way? Are you the young creative hero with the solution? Someone will change the world. What would you do differently if you ruled the planet? It's a huge challenge, but even small ideas today can contribute to a more sustainable world tomorrow. On behalf of scientists, companies, and governments, Wageningen University and Research is seeking your advice. And our students and scientists will be available to help you develop your ideas. How would you ensure plenty of healthy, safe, and sustainable food for all in the future? Join the Wageningen Borlaug Youth Institute and submit your advice with your thoughts. Help solve the greatest challenge of the century. How can we feed the world? Present your advice to CEOs, presidents, and scientists, and win a trip to the USA. So, what would you change if you ruled the world? Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, I have a very special and historical announcement to make to all of you. For the first time, we will really bring the Borlo Youth Institute outside the US to a place which has had a special meaning also to Norman Borlaug, and that is Wageningen University and Research. And indeed, we rank very highly together with US universities. <laughs> I know, won't get into politics, I've just been told. <laughs> but we have, have been and are a leading organization, partly because of our fundamental and applied research, but very much so because we are a youth trainer, particularly of African students, but also students all over the world from China, 
South America, everywhere. And now for the first time, next year, we will celebrate our 100th centennial, our 100th anniversary. And because of that special year, we have decided with the support, the unanimous support of the Council of Advisors, to bring the Borlo Youth Institute to Wageningen. And that's what you just saw, that little, uh, little movie was just a first step. We will do this, however, not alone. We will do it together, of course, with all of you and together with our colleagues. And it's only the first step because, as you know, our laureate of this year has already said he wants a Borlo Youth Institute, or many of them, in Africa. And my European colleagues on the Council of Advisors and elsewhere have said, we want European Borlo Youth Institute everywhere. So you think this thing will be growing and growing. And I think that's very much in the spirit also of Norm Borlo. Didn't he say, bring it to the farmer, but also bring it to the youth, bring it to young people. And when you're 16 and you haven't thought about this problem when you're young, you won't be thinking about it when you're older. And I was one of those students, even younger than that, who thought, having grown up in post-war Europe, I have a responsibility for the rest of the world. And it was Norm, among others, who I got to know quite well when I was a professor and later at the United Nations, who inspired me to be brave. Also to be brave, for example, in my stance on CRISPR-Cas and regulation in Europe, which some of you may know is, is a big issue. So in the spirit of Norman Borlo, we will organize next year in August, with the help of everybody, a Norman Borlo Youth Institute, the first one outside the US and in Europe. And let me say to all of you there at the back, all of you high school students, you are extremely li lucky. You are a privileged generation because more than Norman ever had, you have tools at your disposal that are new and that are exciting and that will make a difference. And it's harnessing the new technology that we have in terms of genetics, in terms of big data, in terms of digitalization, in terms of integrating the food chain that really will make a difference. Never have we had more scientific tools than today. And never have we had a more connected global community. So let us all join that generation, the young generation, and I hope you allow me to still be with you and when you start your work, let us all become young again and join the young generation and find ways to become part of those 10 million hunger fighters. So thank you very much. We'll be there for you. Thank, thank you, Louise. I, I should, forgive me, I, for getting my manners. I should, please, everybody, enjoy your lunch. Uh, and there, and... Uh, We'll be back in a little while to uh, introduce our keynote speaker. So please. So I hope uh, hope everybody uh, enjoyed their lunch. Let's. Uh, Maybe join me in uh, thanking uh, Linda Funk and all our soy sponsors for a wonderful meal, and uh, yes, and 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 thank uh, the Marriott staff for their service. Uh, when we do this, there's uh, 1,125 places set in here, and there aren't many open seats uh, here. And the hotel always says to me, are you crazy? We can't get in and, and serve people uh, here. And they always make it happen. So Marriott staff, thank you very, very much uh, for this. And that. So it, it's now uh, my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, great friend uh, to the World Food Prize. And I have to explain how, how I got to know him. He was at the Gates Foundation. I think he was in his late 20s uh, at the time. And, 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 and looked even younger than he looks now. And, uh, and he and a colleague from Gates were coming to uh, DuPont Pioneer out in Johnston where Paul Schickler was uh, our pres the president at the time. 
and they said to me, you have 20 minutes, you can have a sandwich with him in the cafeteria and tell him about the World Food Prize. So, I was, wow, you know, Gates Foundation, okay, I'm there, and we're sitting at the table, and Raj is at the end of the table with his colleagues. I don't know who's who. Uh, I don't know who's uh, the, the more influential, important person, but the other guy was older, and being from the State Department, if you're older, you have a higher rank. <laughs> so uh, I'm sort of, you know, look and talk, looking down there and talking and talking kind of to the other guy more than to Raj. And, 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 and finally, finally, <laughs> I'm telling him all about the symposium and the subjects we had. And uh, he says, oh, you have pretty interesting uh, topics at your symposium. Suddenly I realized <laughs> who I should be talking to. And he, and he said to me, uh, could you ever put together uh, a panel so I could come to the symposium, I'd speak and tell everybody about uh, what we're thinking, and then I could get some reaction. So uh, I think we have uh, an image of it here. here. Here it is. There's Raj Shah on the stage with Norman Borlaug, Sir Gordon Conway, who's, who's here, and so, <laughs> and that, uh, Catherine Bertini, 2003 World Food Prize laureate, and Dr. Chen Zhangling, uh, who was, yeah. So this was uh, a great uh, group, and had a ch this was the connection. And eventually all of them ended up with a relationship of one kind or another with Gates, uh, and, and sort of getting things launched. And uh, three years later, in 2009, Raj called me up, and he said, Mr. Gates is going to announce his big initiative for Africa. He wants to do it at the World Food Prize because, you know, we've met a more diverse array of people at the World Food Prize than uh, at uh, any other event we've been to. Could you invite him? And, you know, I said, oh, Raj. <laughs> why, 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 why didn't you call sooner? You know, the, the program's already set, and <laughs> you, you think he might put it off till next year? You know, we could really do it right, and so, you know, you know I didn't say that, right? <laughs> the one thing my staff all knows is where are the defibrillators in our building, <laughs> because they, I'm on the floor, and they're jump-starting my heart, and I, and I said to Ryan, of course. <laughs> and so in one of the, I, I think, you know, the moment of 18 years at the World Food Prize was having Bill Gates come here and launch his initiative, which is having such incredible impact uh, the world. But Raj came back, you know, we knew him then when he was at USDA as undersecretary. He, uh, and at the State Department, we would announce our laureate at the State Department, first with Colin Powell, uh, and then this was with uh, Secretary Clinton and it came over a, a, a research initiative in honor of Dr. Borlaug. Back again in 2012, giving the luncheon keynote address. So uh, and now, uh, five years later, back again, president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And in, in my experience, World Food Prize, 18 years, there's no one else I know who's been in that thread of all that's happened from the beginning until now, and who I feel confident will be a part of that thread, as he will, as will our laureate, about the next 18 and 20 and 30 years in the future and making the world incredibly better. Dr. Rajiv Shah. <laughs> now, Raj, the, I, I have one one thing, because there is, Jeannie Laube shared with me a note she sent to you. And I just want to read it to everybody. It said, Dear Raj, I found this note card today. Here it is. One of my desk drawers. I thought you'd like to know that the Borlaug family is so excited and pleased that you'll be leading the Rockefeller Foundation. Daddy was always so impressed by your knowledge and gentle persona. Daddy will be watching as you continue to tackle hunger and ensure health around the globe, as well as social justice for all. 
and I have great memories of the Rockefeller family. Uh, as a child, George Harar, Ed Wellhaven, and many others who were like family to us because we all lived in Mexico. Take care, and if you ever want to show all my dad's medals, I'll bring them to you. Best to you. <laughs> Love, Jeannie Borlaug Laube. Thank you, Ken. I, I don't know what to say after that extraordinary introduction, uh, other than uh, while we do all have different jobs from time to time, uh, what perhaps keeps us coming back is the friendship and the commitment to each other and to the mission we share. Uh, and, and to Jeannie and Julie and the Borlaug family, I remain speechless. Getting that card was the favorite thing that's happened to me in my first six months on this job, and thank you for that. Uh, I do see so many friends and family in the audience today, uh, including my friend and compatriot, the USAID Administrator, Mark Green. I'm so glad you have that job and I don't. <laughs> uh, so did the board. <laughs> uh, and, and I, uh, Friends like Gordon and Catherine and others, uh, when I was coming here in the past, helped me get connected to all the wonderful young people that you inspire through this extraordinary event. Uh, people like Emily Hugan, who I know is one of your awardees, one of the many students and scholars here today with the passion to fight hunger. Uh, Dr. Chuen Jen Lim, who's been recognized yesterday uh, for putting food on the table of millions of families in China. And of course, our dear friend and your extraordinary uh, award winner tonight, Dr. Akina Adashina, a former Rocky Doc at the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, he, I'll tell you, I see Gary Tennyson back there and Gordon's been here, uh, Rob Heck, Peter Matlin. I think you are accepting the award today on behalf of a team. Uh, that's pretty incredible. So congratulations to all of you. And Akeen. <laughs> and congratulations for your friendship and leadership. I'll say in preparing for today, I'd been recalling also my first time here uh, because it was 2006. And we really did come just to learn uh, about what we might do uh, at a time when Warren Buffett was just in the process of making a gift to the Gates Foundation that enabled the creation of the agriculture program there. Uh, in that panel that you made reference to, I did feel so honored and also so humbled to be with, that was the first time I met uh, Dr. Borlaug. And I remember uh, Jeannie saying, well, you could spend some time with him afterwards in his suite. Uh, he wants to talk to you, but he, you know, he uh, is a little bit older and, and will need some rest. And I'd flown in from Seattle and I probably didn't sleep much the night before because I was so excited. Uh, and I was a little tired, so I thought, oh, good, <laughs> this will be a short conversation. Uh, and of course, it went on for hours. <laughs> and Norman had all the energy, you know, and I'm sitting there being like, how can I be a little tired, needing coffee when he's uh, got so much passion and, and energy? But we all know, those of us that have had the great honor of, of meeting and working with him, we know that that passion, ultimately, more than anything, is why this room is so full. Uh, he also said to me then what he most admired, frankly, about the Rockefeller Foundation at that time was how it stuck the course in fighting hunger and poverty. And in that spirit, I'd like to share some thoughts with you today on our past, but also how we'll try to stick the course going forward in this great area of work against this extraordinary mission of fighting and ending hunger. Early next spring will mark 75 years since a young scientist named George Harrar drove a brand new station wagon south across the Mexico border to start the Rockefeller Foundation's Mexican agricultural program. It'll also mark the 50th anniversary of India's first record-breaking wheat crop, the result of a quarter century of work begun in Mexico by Dr. Borlaug, Harrar, and others. But its genesis goes back even further from the earliest letters between John D. Rockefeller Sr. and his Baptist minister turned philanthropic advisor, Frederick Gates, scientific agriculture 
was seen as a promising way to fulfill their foundation's mission of promoting the well-being of humanity throughout the entire world. Initially, the foundation fought disease, building schools of medicine and public health, combating yellow fever and malaria. Then after seeing millions starve during World War II, and as booming population growth threatened to outpace global food production, Rockefeller turned to fighting hunger as the greatest enemy of human well-being. And so the work in Mexico began. In the many years since, we all learned a great deal from how those pioneers advanced the idea that science and technology could be used to fight world hunger and reach the most vulnerable. And we are still in awe of the amazing results that have been delivered and honored through this World Food Prize. Increasing yields to avert massive famine, helping diffuse the so-called population bomb by moving more than a million people off the brink of hunger and starvation. Decades later, we applied those learnings when the Rockefeller Foundation and the Gates Foundation partnered together more than 11 years ago to launch the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. Akeen and I were both proud to be part of that effort. Agnes Kalabata, who leads that effort, is here today. Because of AGRA, which really picked up and extended the legacy of the Rockefeller work in Africa, Today, 15.3 million farmers are using improved seeds. S those smallholder farmers have more than doubled their average yields. And 1.3 million hectares of depleted land have been restored for agricultural production. Most recently, Rockefeller Foundation launched the YieldWise initiative that is focused on reducing food loss and food waste, recognizing the world cannot sustain a nourishing food system if we don't eat more of what we have. In addition to helping farmers in Kenya, Nigeria, and Tanzania reduce post-harvest loss, it's also about combating food waste right here at home. Because 40% of all food produced in this country goes to waste. Next week, we'll be announcing some results of this work, a partnership with the National Resources Defense Council that examined how cities like Denver, Nashville, and New York can better rescue edible, wholesome food to feed those in need. The data is compelling. In one scenario, rescu rescuing food in Denver could alone could close that city's annual meal gap by almost 50%. All these concrete results validate the basic premise that the fight against hunger, especially when anchored in science and social science, can be won. But I know many of you in this room also know what that fight means on an instinctive and emotional level. For the people and places Akeen and I have had a chance to visit together in rural Nigeria with Bill and Melinda many years ago, it means farmers are no longer just subsistence producers, but are participating in a commercial business. It means their families have enough food to feed themselves without having to sacrifice all too often the food intake of women and girls. It means those girls can have the dignity of going to school and believing in their hearts that they deserve a more hopeful future as opposed to one where they might just barely scrape by. I know it's the passion and commitment to delivering those kinds of results that does keep this community coming here every single year. This common sense of purpose is ultimately what's represented in this prize and in Dr. Borlaug's legacy. We've come a long way to the point where in some places you can now tap your phone and have fresh food delivered someday by drone uh, very quickly to your doorstep. Yet for all the progress, we simply have to do better because we live in a world where even today, a child will die every 10 seconds because of chronic or acute malnutrition. Today, the global food system produces one and a half times enough food to feed our entire population, yet still 815 million people, 11% of humanity, don't, will not know where their next meal will come from. It's even a problem here in America. As we sit here today, one in five children go hungry. 
which is unconscionable in the wealthiest and most advanced society in human history. Iowans like former Governor and Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack continue to be champions in fighting child hunger here and around our nation. The same is true for the hidden hunger of malnutrition. Today, two billion people are chronically malnourished, suffering from undernourishment, micronutrient deficiencies, or overweight and obesity. In fact, diet quality is now the number one contributing factor to deaths and disabilities worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. As you all know, these statistics about hunger and malnutrition are really about people. They're about the young girl I held in my arms at a feeding center in Afghanistan who is on the verge of death from malnutrition and who deserved better. And the young boy in Des Moines who's overweight, malnourished, and not able to adequately learn. Both represent the consequences of a food system that is not successfully nourishing the world. It's also failing our planet as agriculture and livestock production are key drivers of global warning, warming and environmental degradation. Globally, meat production accounts for one-third of water use, three-quarters of agricultural land use, and nearly 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions, more than the entire transportation sector. The global livestock sector pumps out the equivalent of over six billion tons of carbon dioxide every year. Now, we all talk constantly about the electric car, but we are will still waiting for someone to invent the electric cow. <laughs> These entrenched challenges are compounded by disparities in access to nutrient-rich food. Go 15 minutes west of here down Interstate 235, there's a Whole Foods off University Avenue where you can buy nourishing, responsibly farmed salmon filet for about as much as a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread but go 15 to 20 minutes in the other direction, east on University Avenue, and until very recently, you were in a food desert that extended from the state fairgrounds to the Des Moines River. In that area, more than 60% of people, one third of whom are low income, live too far from a, a proper supermarket, and are likely to have to rely on shelf-stable convenience store foods for their last minute shopping trips. The global food system is subject to increasingly powerful consumer demands as well. As billions of people in developing countries go from living on $2 a day to $10 a day, we know demand for protein will only go up and go up dramatically. So while our population will grow about 13% over the next three decades, global demand for animal protein will increase much faster rising by as much as nearly 80%. This underscores the parallel challenges of a food system that's fundamentally unsustainable and fundamentally not nourishing everyone it needs to. We see this first here at home, but also around the globe. If every human being consumed as much food as the average American citizen, it would take four Earths to sustain that demand. And yet, every trend indicates that as two to three billion people in emerging economies join the global middle class, the least attractive attributes of the American food system are first in line to shape their health and environmental outcomes. A New York Times article last month about Brazil made this abundantly clear. Our food system excels at getting candy bars, junk food, and soft drinks to the world's poorest people in the most remote places. So much that many countries in the global south have recently seen their obesity rates grow much faster than more developed countries. But it's not very good at getting local farmers in Africa the real-time data they would need to sustain maximum production on the land they're farming, or the technologies that could lead to amazing tomato and other vegetable yields like we've seen in the Netherlands. Seeing these challenges and inspired by our predecessors, we at the Rockefeller Foundation these last few months have been asking, what would Dr. Borlaug do? Borlaug's lifelong mission was promoting agricultural research because to him it was the best way to fight hunger and poverty. He witnessed from Mexico to South Asia how research improved productivity, lowering food prices, and raising farmer incomes. 
He saw Indian and Pakistani farmers more than quadruple their net incomes from $37 per hectare to $162. Food became more accessible, and because food was produced and consumed in close proximity, purchasing power increased for producers and consumers alike, helping them move away from poverty. In doing all this, Norm transformed himself from an agricultural scientist into a fierce global moral leader. Today, a new revolution in food would happen in a much greater context, but with the same potential to expand dignity and justice to vulnerable populations. The link between local production and local consumption of food is still strong, but there's far more trade and mobility, especially for higher value foods. And trade has grown faster than production. Based on our rough analysis of real value growth from 1968 to 2013, while food production worldwide increased by nearly 200%, global food trade increased by more than 400%, and trade in fruits and vegetables by more than 500%. Meanwhile, we know that the basics are still true. From Bjorn Lomberg to the World Bank, we see the data that shows that agricultural research is still one of the most efficient and productive investments you can make to improve the lives of the poor and vulnerable. But it's our opinion that that current research system overemphasizes staple crops to the detriment of protein and micronutrient-rich foods. In the United States alone, going back to 1975, twice as much public R&D funding has consistently gone to grains, oil seeds, and other staple crops than to so-called specialty crops, fruits, vegetables, and nuts, that make a person not only well-fed, but also well-nourished. To meet the world's ever-growing demand for protein, our food system has focused on productivity of animal agriculture, often to the neglect of non-animal sources of protein. Compared to the early 1960s, that's enabled our consumption of animal protein to grow twice as fast as our consumption of vegetable protein. For several years now, the food and agricultural development community has focused on the question of how to feed a future population of 10 billion people. That question is important and necessary, but it's not sufficient. Instead, the question we should ask is, how can we sustainably nourish the world with dignity and equity without breaking the back of our planet. At Rockefeller, our early point of view here is focused around three concepts we hope to explore with you. The first is that as we look around the horizon, we see a clear need to reshape the global protein economy. Focusing on both human health and the environment, we have to fundamentally rethink the way the world provides protein to a growing and ever wealthier global population. As one starting point, we need to better understand how the full range of our planet's protein sources, from beef to farmed fish to lentils, can be used to meet the coming demand. To our knowledge, no one has looked across all these different sources and evaluated them based on how much we can increase their productivity without stretching beyond the means of our natural resources. That's why in the coming months, we'll be working with experts at the World Wildlife Fund and major universities worldwide to conduct this kind of comparative analysis across protein systems. It will evaluate suitability based on food security and nutritional impact, environmental in impact, and projected consumer demands amongst other factors. And we hope it will help us together identify new ways to reshape the global protein economy. Second, as we look at how undernourishment persists at home and abroad, we think micronutrient-rich foods, especially fruits and vegetables, need to be given a much, much higher policy, pricing, and research priority. We want bold and effective ideas to dramatically rebalance the role of these foods in how people eat, making them more accessible, more available, and more affordable for everyone, both here at home and around the world. Third. We don't think we're going to effectively achieve anything on these points without flipping the basic model and thinking of the entry point as deeply affecting consumer behavior and consumer demand today and in the future. As we see with tested, safe technologies, including GMOs and golden rice, how people perceive food 
and their natural demand for those food products ultimately does define our capacity to have the impacts we want to have. In a new food revolution, we can't afford to let innovations become exclusively elitist or charitable only. Instead, they have to be desirable and demanded by all. The end goal is that consumer demand for food and needs to be and should be that they demand not only delicious but also healthy foods in a way that sustains their families and our planet. It will take us time to consider what will come next for the Rockefeller Foundation in these regards. But we do welcome your feedback and hope to learn from you over the course of the next many months as we shape our basic approach. All the while, those of us in this room can never forget Dr. Borlaug's point about sticking the course. Even as we grapple with concepts that may prove to be the levers of real change over time, we must stick the course in helping small-scale farmers, mostly women, improve their incomes and lift themselves and their families out of poverty and hunger, especially in Africa. While we don't know all the details of what we're going to do, we do know that our approach will be grounded in what the Rockefeller Foundation has done for more than a century. Faith in science, priority around innovation, a desire to embrace public-private partnerships, and a fundamental understanding that public policy and political leadership are always critical to shaping a just and equitable food system. And going forward, we will be drawing on that history for not only our work in food, but also other areas. We believe humanity has arrived at a pivotal moment in our history. And as the world surges into a data-driven, decentralized, and hyper-digital era, we will fight to secure the fundamentals of human well-being for even the most vulnerable. We live in a time when it'll soon be possible to hail a self-driving car with phones in our pocket, but a woman in rural India still has to walk hours in the dark just to get clean drinking water or find a working power outlet. We can buy wireless smart socks and networked baby monitors that track our newborn sleep patterns, yet in Africa and Asia, eight infants die each minute, often from diseases we know how to treat and prevent. While the march of progress has and will benefit plenty, it is unacceptable that in a world capable of so much, there are still so many with so little. And it's not only the girl in a developing country who can't go to school because she has to help feed her family. It's also the middle-aged fa factory worker here at home in a Ford plant who hasn't been able to fulfill his dream of becoming an electrician or is starting to see his basic livelihood slip away. In both cases, despair about the future has brought our world to a pivotal moment. People have less trust in institutions worldwide. Rising nationalism is pulling governments inward, away from helping the vulnerable. Anxiety about economic opportunity has fueled populist retrenchment in our politics. Automation and globalization are further separating haves and have-nots. And the global goals that we all fought so hard to make uh, an, a, a, an example of how the world can cooperate to expand the reach of justice are under immense, immense political pressure. Yet it's at this moment that we believe more strongly than ever in our shared capacity to solve the world's toughest problems. We see brilliant minds and moral hearts unlocking powerful tools like data science and digital technology to improve this, the lives of the vulnerable like never before. We see businesses and philanthropies, faith institutions, state and local governments coming together to try to solve tough problems. And we see a moral awakening, particularly in our young, especially tied to this project of the World Food Prize, where people want their lives to have meaning and purpose, not just financial success. And because we get to learn from our own history at the Rockefeller Foundation, embodied in the team that is here celebrating the World Food Prize, we know that we can also learn from the fact and take heart in the fact that we've done this before. We have brought together the most capable people to solve some of the world's toughest problems in the past, and we certainly can do it again in the future.
In fact, the Rockefeller Foundation was born at a transformational time as well, when the powerful intersection of capitalism, science, and leadership literally changed this country and the world. Grounded by a belief in scientific philanthropy, we looked into the future and brought together titans of charitable giving, government, business leaders, and scientists to solve the problems of that past era. Today, informed by that same approach and convinced that this is yet another time of fundamental social transformation, we feel inspired to act boldly and with you. We're determined to bring together the world's most capable people to solve the world's toughest problems. I'll be the first to admit that when it comes to food, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. But here our past makes for good company. After George Harar drove his station wagon to Mexico, it took 25 more years for Dr. Borlaug's work to blossom into the Green Revolution. At the beginning, they probably didn't have it all figured out at the time. But I believe that it's possible, if it's possible today, to grow meat in a laboratory and have drones deliver our food, it is certainly possible to believe that we can end hunger and sustainably nourish the world in the next few decades. We have the tools, we have the technology, we have the political will, we have the moral obligation to do so. All that's required now is our commitment to each other and our commitment to stick the course. I'm willing to stand here today and say that the Rockefeller Foundation is committed to this goal, and we will be for as long as I'm there. And I know it's no small thing to say that in a room packed with some of the world's most important and smartest experts, innovators, and leaders in food and agriculture. That's why I'm asking you to stand with us, work with us, partner with us, and collaborate so that together, as we've done in the past, we can change history in the future. Thank you. Rajiv Shah, wow, well, this is uh, what, a, what an incredible, inspiring message uh, that you've delivered, as you have uh, in the past, when you've been here on behalf of Gates, starting Feed the Future, and now the third phase at the Rockefeller Foundation. So I know you've given uh, great stimulus for, the, for this afternoon, uh, you've been uh, I told Raj I wanted him particularly to speak today with the students in the room because I know all of you have heard and feel inspired by his words. So Raj, thank you again so much for being here. All, the, all that you've done. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm about to close the luncheon, but uh, I have to tell all the students, so everybody gets up to leave, you stay seated because <laughs> and uh, because they'll be special uh, instructions for you as, uh, as you leave. So stay there. Everybody else, thank you for being here. Now rush down to the symposium room. We've got an incredible afternoon uh, to uh, start with an amazing lineup of people to be there. And President Mahama, thank you again for gracing us with your presence. So.